All right. Mic check. Everybody hear me? All right. How's everybody doing? Excellent. It is good to see you while I wrestle with my cord here. Uh, thank you for coming out. Let me, let me give you just a quick little wherewithal uh, of where we are. Then I'm going to have Randy come up in just a moment. But uh, So we're on our second week of these lectures, and I've kind of changed the plan. My original plan was to tell the story in two weeks and then have two other types of lectures. What I've decided this last week is I'll tell the story in three weeks, and then the last week we'll have uh, a lecture where we talk about the value of the Old Testament. So we're only going to make it through part of the Old Testament, the middle part, and then we'll finish it up next week. So that's, that's kind of what we're going to do tonight. We'll go from the Judges to through King David's life, Lord willing. I also want to remind you... Uh, on your, on your way out tonight, if you haven't already and you'd like to, we'd love for you to buy one of our coffee mugs, one of our journals. As a reminder, that money is all going to go toward uh, ministry for the Tom people. Uh, and we're going to have Randy come up in just a minute and just tell you a little bit more about them and lead us in a prayer for them, for their ministry. And again, just a reminder, if you need to get up for any reason, go get a drink of water, restroom, whatever, just have at it. Come and go as you please. We want you to be comfortable, and we're just going to cruise right on through once we get started. So with that being said, Randy, why don't you come up, uh, tell us a little bit more about the Choms. Thank you, Pastor. Good evening, everybody. Next slide, Alex. Hey, Doc. There's always that one. Psalm 67, we read, Be gracious to us, God, and bless us, and cause his face to shine upon us, that thy way may be known on the earth, thy salvation among all the nations. Let the peoples praise thee, O God. Let all the peoples praise thee. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for thou wilt judge the peoples with uprightness and guide the nations of the earth. Let the peoples praise thee, O God. Let all the peoples praise thee. The earth has yielded its produce. God, our God, blesses us. God blesses us that all the ends of the earth may fear him. Does anybody remember how many unreached people groups there are in the world? Who says four? Seventh? Zach, I hope he wins a book tonight. I'm, I'm rooting for you. Sorry? That's right. Oh, that's cheap. 7,000, I wouldn't admit if I cheated, 7,414 unreached people groups still in the world today. Uh, this past week since we left, since we met last Sunday, thousands of people have been born into these unreached people groups. And since we met last week, thousands of people have died in these Christless, unreached people groups and have entered into a Christless eternity. Um, there is the people group that we've been talking about is the Chom. The Chom people, uh, we've decided to send the Ember Lecture Funds to these people. They're an unreached people group among the 7,414. Um, and interesting enough, the historians have found that about 2,000 years ago, they were the Champa people in the Vietnam area. And in 1471, the Viet, the Viet, the Dai Viet took them over, made them slaves, and murdered thousands of them. And the emperor of the Champa kingdom went west with thousands of the Cham people to an area today called Cambodia. Amazingly enough, they have kept their identity as a people group. Ethno-linguistically, anthropologically, they are a people group, but still today without a church. But there's some good news, because two families this past year have moved in with the Champa people to plant a church there. Uh, they're people like you and me. We'll call them the, the, the L people, no, <laughs> the L and G family. And the reason why is because this may go out on the internet. They don't want their names associated with the people group that they're with, mainly because the 
see some people are predominantly Shiite, Muslim. And so just for precautions, that's and a lot of people groups are that way today. So and but like I said, they're like us, they're just like us. Um, the L people, the L family, for example, he is a electrical engineer from Southern California, decided to do church planting as a missionary, went and got his master's in linguistics. His wife has a master's in linguistics, and she was a surveyor of languages in Southeast Asia. And now they have two children living among the people. One was just born about two months ago in Phnom Penh, and they have a little boy who's um, about kindergarten age. And so now they're starting through the process, along with the G family, to learn the Tom language. So do be praying for them. I do have a copy of last month's prayer letter that they sent to me uh, through the Internet. And if you're interested, you can get on the newsletter as well. And that's posted in the back, so you can see them through their letters there. It's really interesting. I also want to mention one thing if you're interested about Unreached People Groups. There's a really cool app on the phone Whoops, I'm sorry, I didn't have it. called the, the Joshua Project. The Joshua Project um, tracks all the unreached people groups of the world, and they put out one every day for prayer. So today is the Balti in India, the unreached people of the day, January 17th, and it gives you their population, 0% uh, Christian, um, primary religion Islam, primary language Balti, and they're in red, which means they're unreached. And some information about them, for example, ministry obstacles, which this lady here wants to be a church planter there, and some outreach ideas on how to reach them. Right now, there are no missionaries there at all. And if you want to pray for them, let's say in your morning devotions, you can tap down here where it says praying. As of right now, 1,666 people have been praying for them today. And tomorrow, there will be another people group. I also want to remind you that um, February 1st, we're going to be starting a course called The Perspective of the Christian World Movement. It's a holistic um, What's the right word? A comprehensive study on missions of the historical per, uh, perspective, anthropological, strategic. It's just a fantastic course on the missionary movement. That course will begin February 1st. If you're interested, meet with us in 101 next Sunday at 315. And without further introduction, we'll open our time in prayer. Let's turn this over to our pastor. Father, we thank you that you reached us. And we are no longer unreached before you. Thank you, Lord, for the person who led me to Christ. And to this day doesn't even realize what an influence he had in my life. A man named Tom Bless. Thank you, Lord, for him. Lord, I thank you for our church. I thank you for the outreach ministries that we've had throughout the world. That we just trust that you would continue to lead us and guide us according to your holy word. Or that you would give us a heart for those who are yet without a church and could not possibly have a church unless someone is sent to them for the purpose of planting a church. Well, I thank you for our pastor who's given us this vision. I ask, Lord, that you would speak through him to us this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I got you. Yeah. Thanks, sir. Right. When Randy read from Psalm 67, took me back to my college days. It was in college when the Lord used some mentors of mine to open up my eyes to that passage and others just to show us that God's heart really is for the nations. And we definitely want that to be clear this month through the Ember Lectures is that we know that we worship a God who is calling us to take his name uh, to the nations. We talked this week that we wanted you to realize that we can't even share the names of the missionaries. We can't share the names of the people who are trying to take the name of Jesus to this people group. And it's a good reminder for us that there are people all throughout our world who are taking very real risks uh, to share the gospel. And I want that to be something we don't forget. So I want you to go ahead and turn in your Bible to the book of Judges. And don't hesitate if you need to, to use the table of contents to find your place. When we find ourselves in the book of Judges, the Israelites, they have been brought over the course of quite some time from Egypt, rescued out of Egypt in the Exodus, 
wandered around the wilderness much longer than they should have because of their own disobedience and unbelief. And then they find themselves finally, the next generation, led by God into Canaan. Their calling is to take over Canaan and then be used to bless all the families of the earth. And so we're going to see how things continue to progress. So the book of Judges shows us how these generations lived in Canaan when they first got there. I want you to go ahead and turn to chapter 2. Let me just tell you that in chapter 1, the Israelites, they start to conquer more of Canaan, but they fail to take it all. I want to read beginning in verse 1. So I'm in chapter 2, verse 1, and I'll let you know we're actually going to do a lot of reading tonight. We're just going to let a lot of the Old Testament kind of tell its own story. So I just want to read verses 1 through 19. And I want you to listen for the pattern of the cycle. You may have remembered I've shared with you about this before. There's a cycle that we have in the book of Judges. So let's just read beginning chapter 2, verse 1. Now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim. And he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. What is this you have done? So now I say, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare to you. As soon as the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the people of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept, and they called the name of that place Bochim. And they sacrificed there to the Lord. You, your Bible may have a note that explains the name of that place means weepers. That's why it was named that. Verse 6. When Joshua dismissed the people, the people of Israel went each to his inheritance to take possession of the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years. And they buried him within the boundaries of his inheritance in timnath Harris, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gosh. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. So this is essentially now the grandkids of those who were rescued out of Egypt. A generation coming along that did not remember, did not know what he had done. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them and bowed down to them. And they provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he gave them over to plunderers who plundered them. And he sold them into the hand of their surrounding enemies so that they could no longer withstand their enemies. Whenever they marched out, the hand of the Lord was with them for harm, was against them for harm, as the Lord had warned. And as the Lord had sworn to them, they were in terrible distress. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of those who plundered them. Yet they did not listen to their judges, for they whored after other gods and bowed down to them. They soon turned aside from the way in which their fathers had walked, who had obeyed the commandments of the Lord, and they did not do so. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge, and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. But whenever the judge died, they turned back, And were more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods, serving them, and bowing down to them. They did not drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways. This passage serves as a bit of a template. It kind of paints the cycle that you see happen over and over and over in the book of Judges. The people rebel against God and his ways. He gives them judgment by having them oppressed by their enemies of the neighboring lands. Then the people finally repent and seek God's forgiveness and grace and victory from their enemies. God is gracious. He sends a judge, a hero, 
The judge helps bring about a victory and deliverance for the people of God. They enjoy a time of freedom, but in due time, inevitably, they fall back into their ways of disobedience, and the cycle would begin again. And so here they are, the judges. Just listen, don't try to write all these down. You have Othniel in chapter 3. After eight years of oppression under Mesopotamia, he rescued the people. They have 40 years rest. Then Ehud, they served 18 years under Moab, and then they had 80 years rest. Then we're introduced to a judge named Shamgar in chapter 3, verse 31. All we really know is that he killed 600 men with an ox goad, okay? He was a manly man. Killed 600 men with an ox goad. Chapter 4, Deborah and Barak. The people served 20 years under the oppression of the Canaanites, and after they judged them and rescued them, they had 40 years rest. Then Gideon came along in chapter 6 through 8. You probably know some of the stories of Gideon. He's the one who had his army whittled down so much that it was obvious God was giving them victory. For seven years, they served under the Midianites. And after Gideon was used by God, they had 40 years rest. Tola judged for 23 years. We come across Tola in chapter 10. Jair in chapter 10 judged for 22 years. Jephthah, after 18 years of the people of Israel being in oppression under the Philistines, Ammonites, and Amorites, Jephthah judged for six years. Then Ebzon judges for seven years in chapter 12. Elon judged for 10 years. Abdon judged for eight years. And then finally we come across Samson, perhaps the most famous judge of all. They were under the oppression of the Philistines for 40 years. And Samson ended up judging them for 20 years. His story ends in chapter 16. And then in Judges 17, I came across a passage I want us to read. I want you to turn to chapter 17. This is a bizarre passage. There are questions that you might ask that I don't have answers for, but I do want us to see this snapshot. I think it's a very intriguing snapshot. I also think it's very indicting for us in many ways. Such an obscure passage of Scripture. I bet this is not on any of our radar unless we just read it very recently. Judges chapter 16, I want to read verses 1 through 6. Follow along with me. There was a man of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Micah. And he said to his mother, The 1,100 pieces of silver that were taken from you, about which you uttered a curse, and also spoken in my ears, behold, the silver is with me, I took it. I don't have the context here. This just sounds like we got, some, we got some family drama going on. Sounds like the son stole from mama and he's owned up to it. So the mother said, blessed be my son by the Lord. Verse 3, he restored the 1,100 pieces of silver to his mother. And his mother said, now what I want you to do from here on out is really see how they're trying to handle their spirituality. His mother said, I dedicate the silver to the Lord, to Yahweh. From my hand, for my son, to make a carved image and a metal image. Now, therefore, I will restore it to you. Now, hopefully, already you think, uh oh, we're heading in the wrong direction. We're talking about images, right? We're not supposed to be making images like this. So, verse 4 says, When he restored the money to his mother, his mother took 200 pieces of silver, gave it to the silversmith, who made it into a carved image and a metal image, and it was in the house of Micah. And the man Micah had a shrine, and he made an ephod and household gods, and ordained one of his sons who became his priest. Look at verse 6. In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Now this passage comes on the heels of all the judges I just briefly introduced you to. And I think here... Among other things this passage could do for us is it gives us a snapshot of how well things are going among the people of God. You see just this microscopic perspective of one family, really part of one family, a mother and a son, and they have problem over money, and they do something that God's law would have told them not to do, and then all of a sudden we see that they, they feel it's a good thing to 
serve other gods and ordain family members and essentially just kind of follow their own spiritual leanings. And then we're told that this is basically an example of how everyone was because everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And I said this is intriguing, but I also wonder if it's indicting. I, I really want to, to just make an argument here. I think it's too easy for us to conjure up our own views of God, to conjure up what we think God is like, what we think a relationship with God is supposed to be like, where we may not have this kind of extreme situation going on, but there are families all around who are worshiping a God that is designed in the image they've given him. They're doing what they think is right in their own eyes, We have to have a standard to follow, and of course, we know that our standard is Scripture, but we've got to be tenacious about that. If you flip forward to chapter 21, the very end, the very last verse of the book, and I highlighted this in last year's lectures, Judges 21, verse 25, we see the same sentiment. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And that's how the book of Judges ends. When you read through the book of Judges, it would be tempting to think that things continue to get so bad that there would be no hope for God's people. But God is always at work. God is always carrying out his redemptive purposes to providential perfection. You never have to doubt this. As a matter of fact, we're going to have a prayer in just a few moments. I want this to be a real encouragement for many of you. You never have to doubt That God is up to his purposes, his plans, to providential perfection. You've probably heard me say before, he's not up there chewing his fingernails because he's nervous. He's not up there wondering what to do. He's not calling committee members together to try to figure out a plan. He knows exactly what he's doing. He's carrying his plans up to perfection even when the world looks like the days of the judges and they were not good. And we learned this truth when we studied the book of Ruth. So a while back, if you were here when we walked through the book of Ruth on Sunday mornings, we saw that the book of Ruth takes place during the time of the judges. It's this beautiful story. I encourage you to read it if you're not familiar with it. Life was hard. God's people were experiencing famine. There was no bread in Bethlehem, the house of bread. So a family decided to seek living elsewhere. We went to Moab, outside the promised land. They thought life might be better away from where God had brought them. In their brokenness, they return after several of them had died, and they bring a foreigner named Ruth with them. And Ruth finds herself becoming a part of the people of God. She became an Israelite by faith. She married a man named Boaz. Boaz was a certain kind of hero. He was a kinsman redeemer. It was his opportunity to take care of Ruth and her mother-in-law, Naomi, and he purchased them to provide for them. Ruth would give birth to Obed, who would be the eventual grandfather of King David. So in the day of the judges, when there was no king and everyone did what was right in their own eyes, there came this time where all along the way, people didn't even realize what God was up to, but he was preparing for King David. And I want you to know this, no matter what, God is always at work. He is always carrying out his plans for his people unto his glory. And I wonder if that's an encouragement that you need tonight. All right, what I want to do is just take a time out. I want to pray, and then we're going to have some giveaways. But I can't help but think that maybe in in some ways we all could benefit from this encouragement to know that no matter what's going on, no matter how hard things seem to be, no matter how off things seem to be, God is still very much involved in intricate ways, in intimate ways, maybe ways that you and I are not aware of. Can you imagine how many people had no idea what God was up to when Ruth and Naomi rolled back into town, just so happened to find themselves in Boaz's field. We saw all the sovereignty of God on full display. He's up to something. He's doing his work, and I think some of you need to be reminded of that. So what I'd like to do is take a moment. Why don't you just close your eyes? Remember, we're here to take our time to take a deep breath. That's why we sit around embers, so to speak. And go ahead and think about, and I'm going to try to do this as well while I facilitate this, think about the things 
that have you concerned. Just kind of roll through them in your mind, things you're worried about. If you don't have any, praise the Lord. Pray for someone that you know may be going through something. And then remind yourself of this. Even when things seem near impossible, even if things seem like they've become such a mess that there's no hope, there is a God. There's one true God. He knows exactly what's going on. He has his purposes and plans that he's going to carry out. And he's calling you to believe him. He's calling you to trust him. And he's not nervous and he's not worried. He's not waiting to see what happens. He knows what's going to happen. He's absolutely in charge. And what he's doing is very, very good. And God, I praise you. I praise you for being in perfect control. Lord, we know that often it is so hard for us to understand that truth. It's hard for us to rest in it. Lord, I am, I am the chief of sinners when it comes to worrying and falling into unbelief. Lord, as we talked about last week, I fear that I would easily have turned away from the promised land when I saw the giants that were inhabiting the land. I would have ignored your promises, Lord. I fear that's what I would have done. And yet I thank you for your grace. I pray that you would just pour your grace all over us tonight. And we are encouraged to know that you're doing your work in such intimate and intricate ways that it would just blow our minds to be aware of everything that you're doing. I thank you for being the kind of God that when we look back, we say, wow, you knew what you were doing this whole time. Lord, thank you for being able to take your people through the time of the judges, continuing them on your plans. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're ready for our first round of giveaways if you guys are interested in any books tonight. As a reminder, we have all the normal people in here. Let's see, what color are they? Normal, yellow. normal people are yellow. Children. Children's. All right, thank you. Okay, so we got normal, just run-of-the-mill, dime-a-dozen people in here. And by the way, just in case there's real sensitive people, I'm just kidding. You're all... You're all made in the image of God. We're all winners in Jesus. Uh, but we're going to give one, one book away to them. So let me go ahead and pull a name out of the bucket here. Kathy Fitzgerald. Give her a round of applause. As a reminder, she is winning a copy of a book by Christopher J.H. Wright called The Old Testament in Seven Sentences. A Small Introduction to a Vast Topic. And uh, congratulations. Enjoy. No Snickers tonight. I might bring Snickers out in a couple weeks. I don't really have questions to ask, so I can't fire Snickers at you. Out of curiosity, because I've already given this book out to our small group leaders. Anybody read it yet or at least gotten their way through it? I found it to be a helpful book. Yeah, good. I see a few hands. Fantastic. Okay, so that was, that was our run-of-the-mill winner. Congratulations, Miss Kathy. <laughs> This is so, if, if Amy was here, she'd be like, you can't talk like that. Then, then we have our all-stars, our small group leaders. Let's see who we got here. All right, I'll look at this first. Let me, let me tell you what this book is. This book is by a gentleman named Dennis Johnson. I read some of his other stuff in my preaching degree. This book is called Journeys with Jesus. Every path in the Bible leads us to Christ. All right, that's my kind of subtitle. Every path in the Bible leads us to Christ. Another book that helps us realize the Bible is one unified word of God that tells one story that he's unfolding. And this is going to be in the library of Sam Rivera. Where is Sam? All right, give him a round of applause. We'll just have awkward silence while I walk this back. Congratulations. All right. And I do encourage those of you who are book lovers, hopefully you're already doing this, but I want to make sure you know what these books are so you can just jot their titles down if you wanted to find them yourself. And of course, you can always email me for a list of the books that we have if you'd like to look into them for yourself. 
All right, so let's get back into our study. I want you to go ahead and turn to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel is directly after Ruth. So Ruth comes right in between the book of Judges and 1 Samuel. Of course, by the end of the days of the Judges, things were horrible for Israel in many ways. They went to war against the Philistines again. And we're going to see that during that war, during that battle, several tragic things took place. I want to read a section of Scripture beginning in 1 Samuel chapter 4. So find chapter 4 with me. And we're going to read the whole chapter. I want you to soak, soak this episode in. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines. They encamped at Ebenezer, and the Philistines encamped at Aphek. The Philistines drew up in line against Israel, and when the battle spread, Israel was defeated before the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men on the field of battle. I want you to note that, the number 4,000. 4,000 men were killed. And when the people came to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? In other words, they're confused, they're frustrated. They're saying, what's going wrong here? So they have an idea. Let us bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord here from Shiloh, that it may come among us and save us from the power of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh and brought from there the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts, who was enthroned on the cherubim, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, we're there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. Now, you may remember last week that we talked about how the book of Numbers, we see a picture where as they traveled, they traveled with three, three tribes on the north, three tribes on the east, three tribes on the west, three tribes on the south, and in the middle would be the Ark of the Covenant. And they were designed that way as an army as they marched. And so here they're thinking, man, we, we got to get that Ark if we're going to have success in this battle. Verse 5, as soon as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel gave a mighty shout So that the earth resounded. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shouting, they said, What does this great shouting in the camp of the Hebrews mean? And when they learned that the ark of the Lord had come to the camp, the Philistines were afraid, for they said, A God has come into the camp. And they said, Woe to us, for nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us, who can deliver us from the power of these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with every sort of plague in the wilderness. Let's just pause here. I actually admire how they have at least some respect. Now, they obviously don't know it's one true God. They're talking about the gods. But they have heard the reputation of the God who struck down the Egyptian. It's almost as if they are showing more faith than the Israelites are in a way. So they say in verse 9 to one another, Take courage and be men, O Philistines, lest you become slaves to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. So the Philistines fought, and Israel was defeated. And they fled, every man to his home. And there was a very great slaughter, for 30,000 foot soldiers of Israel fell. And the ark of God was captured, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. So let's take this in for a moment. They had already been defeated. 4,000 people died. That was enough to convince them they got to do something differently. So they think, well, let's just take the ark. It's worked before. Let's take it again. So they take the ark, and they still lose. And not only do they lose, they lose 30,000 soldiers. We have to try to understand and appreciate the kind of devastation they may have gone through of thinking, what? What do we have to do? What is going wrong? You'd think that this would lead them to a certain brokenness. Let's see what happens. Verse 12. A man of Benjamin ran from the battle line and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes torn and with dirt on his head. When he arrived, Eli was sitting on his seat by the road, watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told the news, all the city cried out, When Eli heard the sound of the outcry, he said, What is this uproar? And the man hurried and came and told Eli. Now Eli was 98 years old, and his eyes were set so that he could not see. And the man said to Eli, I am he who has come from the battle. I fled from the battle today. And he said, How did it go, my son? He who brought the news answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines. 
And there has also been a great defeat among the people. Your two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead. And the ark of God has been captured. As soon as he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell over backward from his seat by the side of the gate. And his neck was broken and he died for the man was old and heavy. He had judged Israel 40 years. So we see he was another judge. Now his daughter-in-law, the wife of Phinehas, was pregnant, about to give birth. And when she heard the news that the ark of God was captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed and gave birth for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the women attending her said to her, Do not be afraid, for you have borne a son. But she did not answer or pay attention. Now, that is devastation. A mom has just given birth and she's not even paying attention because of the horrible news she's just heard. Verse 21 says, she named the child Ichabod saying, the glory has departed from Israel. Because the ark of God had been captured and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, the glory has departed from Israel for the ark of God has been captured. So we see that Israel's defeated. Eli's sons, who by the way were wicked priests, they're killed. Eli, the judge, died. And worst thing of all is the Philistines got the ark. So Eli's daughter-in-law has a baby named Ichabod. The glory has departed. Things were so bad, it was as if the glory of God himself had departed from the promised land. So let's think about this. How did God's people, how could they process God's covenant promises during such a time? Just just try to put yourself in their shoes. I mean, it's hard for us to do, but try to put yourself in their situation where you can see things have gotten so bad, absolute devastation, complete defeat, and the ark of the covenant of God has been stolen by the enemies. This would have been the complete disorienting, devastating, defeating experience. Under Eli's supervision... God raised up another leader. His name is Samuel. Now, we just read his name at the very beginning of the chapter, but we weren't introduced to him because I cruised over chapters 1 through 3. Samuel led the people of Israel during the transition from the judges to the kings. The people started to demand a king. They wanted things to work out better, so they thought they had a solution. I want you to go to chapter 8, 1 Samuel chapter 8. Let's read this chapter. So they're going to demand a king. They want a king just like all the other nations had. So we're going to see how that plays out. Verse 1. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel and the name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba, yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. In other words, people are not being led well. When there is a lack of leadership, when there's a void of leadership, you pick your organization. It could be a church, it could be a company, a nation. In this case, the people of Israel, when there's a void of leadership, the people are going to try to figure out some way to make it work. And so this is what they're doing. They're saying, look, Samuel, you're old. You can't keep this going. Your sons are worthless. So appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. And that just shows you the problem that they have. They look at all the solutions the world has to offer. And they think, well, let's just find a solution that the world has to offer. We want a king just like all the nations. Verse 6, but the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I have brought them out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king from him. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. 
He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. He will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said no. But there shall be a king over us. That we also may be like all the nations. And that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And when Samuel heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, obey their voice and make them a king. And Samuel then said to the men of Israel, go every man to his city. You see, God was their king and they were supposed to realize that God was their king. God wanted them to acknowledge him as their only king. Nevertheless, God knew all along that they would demand a king. He already knew that this would happen. He eventually gave them what they asked for. He gave them a king. He gave them a king just like all the other nations had. And we're going to meet this king. I want you to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 15. We're going to keep doing a lot of reading. I want you to hang in there with me. So God has anointed through Samuel. He's anointed Saul to be the first king. And let's just see how well Saul does in 1 Samuel chapter 15. Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people Israel. Now therefore listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel And opposing them on the way when they came out of Egypt. Okay, let me just catch us up to speed. As they've been saved out of Egypt, they came across Amalek, who was one of their early opponents. He says in verse 3, now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. In other words, go get revenge on Amalek. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, Camel and donkey. That's a serious charge God gave him. So Saul summoned the people and numbered them in Telium. 200,000 men on foot and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. Then Saul said to the Kenites, another group, he says, Go, depart, go down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the people of Israel when they came out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. And Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. He took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. and devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. But, there's that word again, verse 9, but. Let's see what happens. But Saul and the people spared Agag. And the best of the sheep, and of the oxen, and of the fattened calves, and the lambs, and all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. Let's make sure we understand what's going on here. God told Saul, destroy them all, destroy it all. Saul rolls into town, has a great victory. But he doesn't destroy everyone and everything. He doesn't destroy the king. He doesn't destroy all that they thought would be good and valuable. It says they despised all that was despised and worthless. That's what they devoted to destruction. He did not obey. So let's see what happens. And this, you talk about an indicting passage of scripture. This is human nature on full display, by the way. We justify our own disobedience. 
The word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry, and he cried to the Lord all night. And Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning. And it was told Samuel, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself. That's not a very humble king. Set up a monument for himself, turned and passed on, and went down to Gilgal. And Samuel said to Saul, came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen that I hear? I find that funny. Saul says, They brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have devoted to destruction. Do you hear yourself in Saul? I do. We justify our own disobedience. Well, look, we, we did this part right, knowing full well what God has told of us. Where am I? Verse 16, then Samuel said to Saul, stop. I will tell you what the Lord said to me this night. And he said to him, speak. And Samuel said, though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go, devote to destruction the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? Now this right here, this is our tendency to pounce on the spoil. I mean, really do, do some good personal work. Think, man, how, how do we have that tendency to just yeah, we'll obey the Lord, but we want to try to grab this right here for our own keeping. If we pounce on the spoil, it says it's, we've done what is evil in the Lord. I keep losing my place. What verse am I in? 20. Thank you. Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Am Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction but the people took of the spoil. Now he's starting to blame it on them. The people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the best of the things devoted to destruction, to, fat, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. And we're going to worship with all this stuff. We grabbed all this stuff to sacrifice. And Samuel says, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? In other words, God doesn't want your fake worship. He wants your obedience. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. And so on and so forth. And we'll see that Samuel has to take matters into his own hands, and he, he cuts Agag in pieces. Look at verse 23. Let me read this last little verse. For rebellion is as of the sin of divination. Presumption is of iniquity and idolatry. He tells Saul, because you have rejected the word of the Lord... He has also rejected you from being king. And so now there's going to be another king. Just go over to verse, or to chapter 16. Let's read the first 13 verses. Let's see who's next. I bet many of you know this story. So the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. And invite Jesse to the sacrifice. And I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. And you remember... I mentioned Bethlehem already, right? From the book of Ruth, the house of bread, where there was no bread. He came to Bethlehem, and the elders of the city came to meet him trembling, and they said, do you come peaceably? He said, peaceably. I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves, and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons, and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab, and he thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Do you ever need that reminder? We fall into this trap of thinking 
that from our eyes, with our perspective, if someone seems impressive, well, surely this is the one. Or circumstances seem favorable, favorable, surely this is the path. God says, don't look at his appearance. He says, man does that. Man looks on the outward appearance. The Lord looks on the heart. It was, the, it was man looking on the outward appearance that kept them from going in the promised land in the first place. They said, these people are too big for us. It was a problem all along. God says, the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest. But behold, he's keeping the sheep. So in other words, the way we went, but you have the runt, but he's just the shepherd boy. That's what he's saying. And Samuel said to Jesse, send him, get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. David is anointed king. The anointing of God was clear and powerful on David's life. For a while he would kind of live in relative obscurity, but he began to appear in his leadership role, particularly through some astounding military victories. Most famously, when all the army of Israel was too scared of the Philistines because of how big they were, sounds just like they were before they entered the promised land, David had enough courage and faith. He demonstrated faith in the one true God, and he killed Goliath the giant. It wasn't long after this victory that David became very famous throughout Israel. He was even more famous than Saul. So let me make sure things are clear. Saul's still the acting king. God's just pulled his anointing away from him. Put it on David. David is now becoming more famous than Saul. You could say he was ten times more famous than Saul. The women sang about David. This is what they sang. Saul had struck down his thousands, but David his ten thousands. Saul became jealous. You would too. Could you imagine being Saul hearing that song? He no longer enjoyed the anointing of God. It was on David instead. So Saul raged against David. David was used to come and soothe Saul. He'd come and play for him. And yet David became his rival, his threat. He could not be left alive. So Saul tried multiple times to kill David. However, Saul would eventually die in battle while God preserved and sustained David. Now what I just did was gave a pitiful, brief summary of 1 Samuel 16 through 31. Y'all can't be here all night, so I just had to summarize it. Saul dies. David wins. God has a covenant to establish with his anointed king. We're going to see that covenant in just a moment. Let's have another giveaway real quick. All right. The next participant to possibly win the Old Testament in seven sentences, Con Chaddick. Come on, there you are. Give him a round of applause, everybody. Congratulations, sir. All right. And this next book here is edited by a guy named D.A. Carson. Some of you may know that name, prominent scholar. The book is titled, The Scriptures Testify About Me. And the subtitle is Jesus and the Gospel in the Old Testament. And this is basically a collection of of sermons uh, that are preached by various preachers, uh, many of them you would know, uh, Al Mohler, Tim Keller, Alistair Beck, James McDonald, Conrad and Bayley, Matt Chandler, Mike Bullmore, and D.A. Carson. So I think it's eight sermons. Uh, they take Old Testament passages and they preach the gospel from this. The scriptures testify about me. And this is going to go to... Wow, you're living right. Becky Presley, she is living right. And you're, if I'm correct, you're eligible for the superhero giveaway too, aren't you? Fantastic. You'll pass that along. All right, congratulations. All right. All right, 
Raise your hand if you feel real jealous and envious when someone wins a book. Yeah. <laughs> it was like you were waiting for me to ask that question. That was like confessional. Yeah, that's me. All right. All right. God has a covenant to establish with his anointed king. I want you to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 7. Now, my hope right there, as soon as I said that, I hope that in a, in, in a way you kind of rolled your eyes because you're like, oh my gosh, he's bringing up 2 Samuel 7 again. I never want you to forget about 2 Samuel chapter 7. In this chapter, we're going to see God establish his covenant with King David. David wanted to build a house for God. God told David that he would not be the one to build a house for God. Instead, David's son would do that. And so he made a promise to David. He made a covenant. What I want to do is read at least a chunk of that. I'm going to begin reading in verse 9. And uh, follow along as best you can. There's a couple places where I think I'll just kind of bounce ahead just to be somewhat brief. So this is what God says in verse 9. Let me just double check that I'm, yes. I have been with you wherever you went. And have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. Now, do you hear an echo there? I will make for you a great name. That's an echo of Genesis chapter 12. And he made that promise to whom? Yes, Abraham. I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And by the way, that was what all the people in Genesis 11 were trying to accomplish with the Tower of Babel. Remember that? He says, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. Now, he's there reiterating the promise of land. Skipping ahead a little bit, he says, I will give you rest from all your enemies. I want to make sure you know, let's see, that's in the middle of verse 11. I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you. Now, do you remember when we first came across the, name, the word offspring? All the way back in Genesis chapter 3. All the way back, there's this promise of offspring all along through Scripture. He says, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body. I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Then in verse 16, in your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. That is God's covenant with David. Highlight it, circle it, dog ear it, whatever you got to do to know that that is such a significant passage of Scripture where God is promising profound things to David and through his lineage. And then four chapters later, tragedy happens. Just four chapters later, after David gets this promise, 2 Samuel 11 comes. And I think we have time to read at least a good chunk of this. Let's read a bunch of this. 2 Samuel chapter 11. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, you remember what the Israelites said? We want a king who will lead us out to battle. The time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Reba. In other words, they had a great victory, but David remained at Jerusalem. He's not where he's supposed to be. He's supposed to be leading his people out to battle. He's not. Let's see what happens. Verse 2. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman, And one said, uh, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And I think he's saying, hey, this lady's, you know, she's taken. He ignores it. David sent messengers, took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. She had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So now he's in a predicament. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. Now you are about to see a contrast between David and all of his uh, lack of integrity, all of his cowardice. And then you're going to see Uriah, the shining paragon of character and integrity. Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab was doing, how the people were doing, how the war was going. David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. 
Uriah went out of the king's house, and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. When they told David Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, Have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? And Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah dwell in Booth, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to ink? To eat and to drink and to lie with my wife as you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Can you imagine how that felt to David to hear that? He's saying, I wouldn't even dream of going to see my own wife while the army of Israel is at battle. Can you imagine? And David invited him, verse 18, he ate in his presence and drank, so he made him drunk. And in the evening he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go to his house. In the morning David wrote a letter to Joab, and he sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting, and then draw back from him that he may be struck down and die. Man, he just told the commander of his army, the army he's supposed to be leading, to abandon one of his best just because he had to cover up his own sin. So with the authority of a king, we see David take a woman, get her pregnant, devise a corrupt plan, have her husband killed. He would eventually take her as his wife. And yet we know something from Scripture. I want you to look, chapter, we're still in chapter 11. Look at verse 27. Look at the very last sentence. The thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Let you see some. This is going to help us as we learn how to read the Bible more. I want you to know the value of the narrator in the Bible. You learned about narrators as you, uh, you know, went through school learning. But the narrator in the Bible is very, very valuable, very powerful. Often has omniscience. It is essentially the viewpoint of God. And we see all this story, and we imagine what David was thinking. I said, can you imagine what David thought? We wonder what Uriah is thinking. We don't know what Bathsheba is thinking. And yet the story ends, and we're told what God thinks. The thing that David had done displeased the Lord. I want you to see what happens in chapter 12. Look at verse 1. The Lord sent Nathan to David. Nathan was a prophet. He came to him, and he said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich, And the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him, but he took the poor man's lamb. And prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold. Because he did this thing. And because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. Now I want you to remember the covenant. Just five chapters before. Now this is what God promises David. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. And I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord has also put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. Then Nathan went to his house. 
And what we see here is that this kind of corruption could not go without consequences. Kings may have a tendency to feel like they're invincible, they're untouchable, but we learn here there are consequences to what King David did. God remained faithful to his covenant with David, but he also remained faithful to his own righteousness. Bathsheba's child died. David's other children suffered in the corruption of their father, and yet David was not fully condemned before God. You see what David said in verse 13? I have sinned against the Lord. And then Nathan says to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. So in this chapter, we see a snapshot of the reality of sin and its terrible consequences. Sometimes it's generational consequences, which we are about to see unfold very rapidly in the life of David's children. But we also see the reality of redemption and grace God is covering, somehow, he's going to cover David's sin. Now, if we keep going, just know in 2 Samuel 13, as an example of how bad things got in David's family, one of his sons named Amnon desired his own sister, Tamar. He wanted her so badly, he raped her. This rape created a vision among the children of, Ab- of David David's other son, Absalom, murdered Amnon and then conspired to take his father's throne. You remember back when we looked at Adam and Eve? They fell into sin, and they disobey, and then just like that, what happens with the next generation? Murder between siblings. Now here we see this king fall greatly, and the very next generation, there's murder and rape between siblings. Now... Absalom is seeking his father's throne, and in a weakness that I believe exposed David's true spiritual state, David fled from Jerusalem. David became an exile from his own country, and I just wonder if we're supposed to see a little foreshadowing here. David is now in exile, and if you know anything about the Old Testament, you know that we're going to see the reality of exile next week, so perhaps this is Some foreshadowing. All right, let's do one last giveaway. We're going to bring it home after this. We're doing good on time. Okay, now this is the whole shebang because we're going to give away the superhero book too. First, a copy of the Old Testament in seven sentences is going to go to Michael Day. Michael, I saw you come in. Where are you sitting? There he is. Give him a round of applause. All right, congratulations, sir. All that free time you've got, you can read that book, Our New Treasurer. Okay, the next book I'm going to give away, this is by two gentlemen named Trent Hunter and Stephen Wellam. I believe they're both professors at Southern Seminary. This book is titled Christ from Beginning to End. Do you all want to know the subtitle? Sure you do, because subtitles are where it's at. How the full story of Scripture reveals the full glory of Christ. This was almost the giveaway book. Then I realized this one's quite a bit more expensive than that one. And so here we are. So I'm giving away one. Christ from beginning to end, how the full story of Scripture reveals the full glory of Christ. And this one is going to Joanne Bradstreet. Where are you, Joanne? Oh, oh so close. Is this going to really hurt? <laughs> Just kind of just kind of hold it like this. And just be like, oh, thumb through it a little bit. Like, oh, this looks real interesting. See how she handles that. Kind of test her. All right, congratulations, Joanne. Now, we have a superhero book to give away. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this. It's a pretty popular children's story book that came out oh, 10 years ago or so by Sally Lloyd-Jones. This is the Jesus Storybook Bible. Subtitle, Every Story Whispers His Name. Over 2 million copies sold. Probably a lot more since this one was actually printed. Uh, raise your hand if you're familiar with this little book. I recommend it. If you have young children, grandchildren, the Jesus Storybook Bible. It takes 40 very famous stories in Scripture and tries to demonstrate how those stories in the Old Testament are fulfilled through Jesus. So I love the approach of the book. Uh, So let's go ahead and see who's going to get this. All right, tonight, I cannot believe this. Tonight's superhero is Becky Presley. (laughs) 
Hey, hey, this is in the Lord's hands now. Don't even make me try to handle all this. You got to deal with this. Look, you're living right, okay? You're living right. I wonder, you probably have multiple copies of it, don't you? All right. Congratulations, Becky. If y'all want to know how Becky takes care of her spiritual disciplines, then you can ask her. She's obviously living right before the Lord with all this prosperity for her. So, all right. Congratulations. Okay. Now, we're going to do some more summary, and then we're going to read two more passages at length, and then we're going to bring it home tonight. In 2 Samuel 19 through 22, I do want you to know that David eventually does return to Jerusalem. He has more battles in his career, more victories, and then something that seems peculiar to me, it might be peculiar to you, something peculiar happens in chapter 24. Go ahead and turn, 2 Samuel 24. Let me go ahead and tell you what has just happened. I'm going to begin reading in verse 10, but what's happened In verses 1 through 9, as David takes a census, he counts all the people. And the impression that you get is it's it's an action out of pride. He wants to see how many people he's in charge of. It doesn't make the Lord happy at all. So he has this census taken. And in verse 10, we see that David's heart struck him after he had numbered the people. In other words, he, he felt conviction. And David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. But now, O Lord, please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. And I just want to point out that with David, again, we see foolishness. And I'm not forgetting the fact that King David really is, like, in many ways, like the bright shining star as far as all the human kings go in the Old Testament. He's he's King David. And yet we see that he is so human and so frail, and he falls into this foolishness, has to come before the Lord. All the while, the Old Testament has ways to remind us that we still have not found the ultimate redeemer yet, the ultimate king, the ultimate rescuer. In verse 11, we're told, When David arose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say to David, Thus says the Lord, Three things I offer you, choose one of them that I may do it to you. Okay, now I want you to put yourself in David's shoes and see what you would decide. So Gad came to David and told him and said to him, Shall three years of famine come to you in your land? Or will you flee three months before your foes while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days pestilence in your land? Now consider and decide what answer I shall return to him who sent me. So just before we keep going, just ponder yourself. All right, would you rather three years of famine, three months of defeat and war, three days pestilence? Let's see what David says. David said to Gad in verse 14, I am in great distress. Let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is great. But let me not fall into the hand of man. So for what it's worth, I kind of like his rationale there. Just, I just throw myself in the Lord's hands. So the Lord sent a pestilence on Israel from the morning until the appointed time. And there died of the people from Dan to Beersheba 70,000 men. And when the angel stretched out his hand toward Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from the calamity and said to the angel who was working destruction from among the people, It is enough. Now stay your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. Now, I have thought each time I've read this. Now, if you were Aruna, would you not be thankful in that moment that, oh, the angel of destruction decided to stop at my house? Like, praise the Lord, I'm still alive. So the angel stopped at the the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. Then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people. And he said, behold, I have sinned, I have done wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Please let your hand be against me and against my father's house. And Gad came that day to David and said to him, Go up, raise an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. So David went up at Gad's word as the Lord Lord commanded. And when Aruna looked down, he saw the king and his servants coming on toward him. And Aruna went out and paid homage to the king with his face to the ground. And Aruna said, Why has my lord the king... Come to his servant. Now that's quite a question. 
Uh, just imagine being David. This man, humble, comes, bows down, and says, Why has my Lord the king come to his servant? The answer is, I'm here at your house because I've made such a knucklehead of myself that all these people died, and if it weren't for God's mercy, you'd be dead too, but you're the first one not dead. That's why I'm at your house. That's quite a question. I see irony there. I think that's kind of interesting. I don't know about y'all. David says this, to buy the threshing floor from you in order to build an altar to the Lord that the plague may be averted from the people. Then Aruna said to David, let my Lord the king take and offer up what seems good to him. Here are the oxen for the burnt offering and the threshing sledges and the yokes of the oxen for the wood. All this, O king, Aruna gives to the king. In other words, he's like, look, you don't have to buy it. I'll give it to you. And then we have this back and forth. And Aruna said to the king, may the Lord accept, your God accept you. But the king said to Aruna, no, but I will buy it from you for a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord responded to the plea for the land, and the plague was averted from Israel. If anything, does this episode not remind us of our fragility apart from the grace of God? I want to be careful here, but I do want to say it seems kind of timely too. I mean, we, we can relate to knowing how thousands and thousands of people are dying because of a plague right now. I don't think it's because of one king's sin or anything like that. It's just a reminder of our fragility. And we see this taking place at the very end of King David's career. Apart from the grace of God, we are absolutely vulnerable. Without help, without a foundation to stand on. Well, if you flip into 1 Kings, chapter 1 and 2, David dies, Solomon becomes king. I want to finish tonight by reading a part of 1 Kings, chapter 2, and then we'll finish. 1 Kings, chapter 2, I'm going to begin reading in verse 1. When David's time to draw to die drew near, he commanded Solomon his son, saying, I am about to go the way of all the earth. Be strong and show yourself a man and keep the charge of the Lord your God. Walking in his ways and keeping his statutes, his commandments, his rules and his testimonies. As it is written in the law of Moses that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. That the Lord may establish his word that he spoke concerning me saying, If your sons pay close attention to their way. To walk before me in faithfulness with all their heart and with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. Let me pause there and just point out what David is doing is he is drawing on the law given through Moses. He's drawing on the covenant that we read in 2 Samuel 7. He's saying, be careful to do all that is written in the law and don't forget that God has promised that if my sons are faithful, they will be on the throne. Verse 5, moreover, you also know what Joab, the son of Zariah, did to me, how he dealt with the two commanders of the armies of Israel, Abner, the son of Ner, and Amasa, the son of Jether, whom he killed, avenging in time of peace for blood that had been shed in war, and putting the blood of war on the belt around his waist and on the sandals of his feet. Act, therefore, according to your wisdom, but do not let his gray head go down to Sheol in peace. But deal loyally with the sons of Barzillai, the Gileadite, and let them be among those who eat at your table. For with such loyalty they met me when I fled from Absalom, your brother. And there is also with you Shimei, the son of Gera, the Benjaminite from Baharim, who cursed me with a grievous curse on the day when I went to Mahanaim. But when he came down to meet me at the Jordan, I swore to him by the Lord, saying, I will not put you to death with the sword. Now, therefore, do not hold him guiltless, for you are a wise man. You will know what you ought to do to him, and you shall bring his head, his gray head down with blood to shield. So basically, David's saying, I need you to tie up my loose ends for me. That's what he's saying. Verse 10, then David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. And the time that David reigned over Israel was 40 years. He reigned seven years in Hebron and 33 years in Jerusalem. So Solomon sat on the throne of David, his father, and his kingdom was firmly established. Now that last sentence sticks out to me. Not only is it a transition from David to uh, Solomon, but I think it's ironic. 
Solomon sits on the throne of David, his father. A son of David sitting on the throne. We're told in 2 Samuel 7, God has promised that there would always be a son of David on the throne. And we're told that his kingdom was firmly established. And yet knowing what we know about the rest of the Old Testament, we have to ask, really? Was it really firmly established? Well, yes, sort of. But we're going to see how maybe we have to ask that question a couple ways next week. Before I close this in prayer, I want to uh, invite you to something. I want you to put this on your calendar. Now, we're looking down the road a little bit in October, but you may want to put October 19th, 20th, and 21st on your calendar. Raise your hand if you went to the fall conference in Ridgecrest this past October. Okay. Oh, man, great. Several of you in here. went. We had a great time. We did similar types of things. It was a little different, but we did a similar type of thing. We walked through uh, the book of Jude together. Well, this year we're already booked to go to Ridgecrest again, October 19th through 21st. It's a Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And the plan, we'll see what the Lord has for us, but the plan is to go through the book of Philemon together. I don't know how much of you, how many of you have studied the book of Philemon. It's actually just, it is rich. And so we're going to do that. But I wanted to go ahead and put this on your calendar. So it's very similar to these types of Ember Lectures. There's also worship, a great time. And so we would love to have you with us. I want to thank you for coming out tonight. Let me close us in prayer. God, I thank you so much for your word. I pray that as a church family, we would always grow more thankful, more grateful that you saw fit to reveal yourself through Scripture. God, I thank you for the opportunity to just sit around together, sit around your word like the embers of a fire and just listen to a story being told. And Lord, I know that it was told very imperfectly, very insufficiently. God, we know we could, we could be here all week just extracting all the, the richness out of your word, all of the intricacies out of your story. But I do thank you for this time where we could at least canvas the time of the judges, the time of King Saul, and the the leadership of King David. God, I praise you that you have shown yourself faithful to carry out your purposes through it all. And we saw today that much of it is a mess. The judges were a mess. Saul and David... They too were messes, maybe in different ways, but we're all human. The very famous hymn says, we're all prone to wander. We're prone to leave you. We're fragile and frail. We're human. What apart from you, we're fallen and sinful. And yet you redeem us and you carry out your plans regardless and you're faithful to your covenant. Lord, I pray that as a church that we would that we would grow in our faith where we know we worship a God who is faithful to his covenant promises. God, you have been faithful to what you promised Eve, what you actually promised the serpent through Eve, that that her offspring would crush the serpent's head. God, we thank you that in spite of the peoples of the earth trying to make a great name for themselves and building a tower in Genesis 11, that you're faithful and gracious in chapter 12 to call one man and promise that you would make a great name through him, and that you would bring a blessing to all the families of the earth through him as they continue to spread throughout the world. God, I thank you for being faithful with your people and hearing their cries in Egypt and rescuing them out of bondage and leading them patiently and graciously through the wilderness and into the promised land. Lord, I thank you that you gave them victory. You showed your power over and over again, and yet we know that they still wandered away from you. They followed other gods. After all that, they still followed the gods of their enemies. Lord, that's how prone we are to wander from you, is that if it weren't for your grace, We would worship the God of our enemies. And yet you are faithful through it all. And you would bring one judge after another to rescue your people. And even then they cried out for a king. Rejecting you as their one true king. 
And they learned the hard way, as we will see, especially next week, that a human king was not going to be what they ultimately needed. And yet you're faithful to give covenant promises, and I thank you for that. God, I pray, I pray that we walk out of here tonight rejoicing in our God who fulfills your promises to us. God, if there are any in here who, who don't know you, Lord, I pray that you would open their eyes to you, that you would open their heart to you. Or for those who are struggling, I hope that tonight, even if it was a lecture, even if it was uh, very monotone and, and, and one-sided from me to them, Lord, I pray it was still devotional in spirit for many of us, where they hear you speaking to them, encouraging them. If they would start to look in the, the details of their life and see you at work very intimately among them. We thank you for everything that you do, where we look forward to next week. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys very much. Y'all have a wonderful night.